Okay, I want to call the uh, chat meeting to order, um, and we'll start by introducing ourselves again. My name is Phil Merkus, and uh, contrary to what the little sign says, I'm the chair of the chat committee. Uh, and um, Bern. Good morning. I'm Bernard Schwetz, and I want to confirm that Phil is the chair. <laughs> And also, that I'm, I'm, I'm the vice chair. Thank you. Holger Koch, so I'm honored to sit next, sit next to the vice chair, uh, Ruhr University, Bochum, Germany. Chris Jennings, Biostatistics, um, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Richard Sharp from uh, University of Edinburgh, UK. And uh, um, I, I come under the title invited expert, which I find rather um, <laughs> disturbing. Uh, <laughs> That is clear. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Buckelhide, Brown University, and also an invited expert. Russ Hauser from Harvard School of Public Health. Andreas Kortenkamp. Uh, I used to be from London University, but now I'm uh, with Brunel University's Institute for the Environment. Michael Babich, I'm the CPSC project manager. Okay, this morning um, we're going to start off with a, uh, a presentation from uh, Rebecca Cluel um, on the DINP dose response studies that they have performed. Uh, and then we're going to have our uh, two uh, presentations from our invited uh, experts. Uh, Mike, and do you have something? Well, let me just remind everyone this is a public meeting, okay. it's being uh, webcast and recorded. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you all for coming. Rebecca. No, that didn't help. Full screen mode? Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, I want to thank you for letting me come today and speak about these studies. I'm pretty excited because we're finally at the stage where we can call them final. The manuscripts have been submitted um, last week, and so hopefully we can get this out there in the public and let you see what's happening. Um, I am a research investigator at the Hamner Institutes. We have a long history of research in the phthalates. We used to be CIIT, Centers for Health Research, and before that we were Chemical Industry Institute for Toxicology. And um, our work began with Paul Foster and carried on with several scientists you've probably heard of, including Eve Milchrist and Kevin Guido. And I worked with Kevin Guido for, for a little while before he moved on to the FDA. So. Um, these studies have been funded by ExxonMobil, and uh, they requested that I speak here today. But I would like you to know that this is this is work that was performed independently at the Hamner. So, all right. Oh, how to go to the next? Oh, that'll work. Okay. So there's a long history in the phthalates kind of defining the window of susceptibility for exposure and lifelong effects. Um, the studies that I'm presenting here today were aimed at really kind of covering this entire window with as much as comprehensively as possible, um, including the possible effects in, in the fetal rat from gestational exposure and then also in the adult or at least juvenile rat uh, through gestation and lactational exposure. In addition to that, we did a kinetic study, which pretty comprehensively I examined the pharmacokinetic behavior of DINP at several doses during gestation in order to get an idea not only of the external dose relationship to effect, but the internal fetal target dose. So, so I'm going to start with the gestation study. The design um, 
was to to evaluate. Well, the design was basically um, put together to determine the the fetal dose, the fetal target tissue dose at uh, several different doses of DIMP. Uh, we looked at six different time points. We looked at three different doses: 50, 250, and 750 milligrams per kilogram per day. We, the dosing design was based on previous studies with other phthalates, which showed the sensitive window to be from gestation day 12 to 19. And we examined, in addition to the metabolite kinetics, we also examined fetal effects at 2 and 24 hours post-dosing on GD19 and 20 in the fetal rat. Uh, we looked at five different metabolites. And I suppose I'm going to start with the effects studies, so I won't talk too much about the metabolism. but. Um, for all of the hormone and histopathology effects, we looked at a, an N of 8, which is 8 liters. And uh, for AGD, we looked at every single male pup from the 8 liters. For the testosterone, we looked at 2 to 3 pups per liter, and then average, measured them individually and then averaged them by liter. Uh, by liter. So, for the developmental effects for testosterone at two hours post-dosing, we did see a significant decrease in testis testosterone at two hours post-dosing for the 250 and 750 milligram per kilogram per day doses. Um, when we looked at 24 hours after the dose, uh, the testosterone levels had recovered even at 750 milligram per kilogram per day. I did include some information here on the other phthalates so that you can compare the potency. This is similar to what um, Earl Gray's lab has seen and Hannes et al. their recent publication that uh, DIMP is significantly less potent for the testosterone um, inhibition. Though what we're interested in is not only relating these these phthalates on external dose, um, on the, on the uh, evaluating them by external dose, but also internal dose, because across the phthalates, metabolism can be quite different. For anagenital distance, we did not see a decrease in anagenital distance on GD20 for absolute or scaled AGD at doses up to 750 milligrams per kilogram per day. That is, um, I believe, similar to what other people have seen. So, and uh, for histopathology, we examined the seminiferous tubule diameter, which an increase in seminiferous tubule diameter has been established as a marker of dibutyl phthalate exposure. We did not see any increase, and this was measured quantitatively with uh, imaging software, where we measured each individual tubule in all of our um, slides, and then averaged by, by slide, and we didn't see any change. And uh, we also had a, a two pathologists actually looked at this slide, and neither of them saw any significant difference in this in the seminiferous tubules. There was an increase in multinucleated gonocytes, or as Kim Buckelhide has made clear to me, they're actually germ cells. But from a morphological standpoint, they still look like gonocytes. And so, the pathologists who looked at these, which uh, uh, Gabrielle Wilson from EPL and uh, Diane Creasy from Huntington Laboratories. Um, or Huntington Life Sciences, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, called them gonocytes. So we did see a significant increase at 250 milligrams per kilogram per day. And this, we also, in addition to that, uh, the pathologist noted an increase in the number of animals with large latex cell aggregates at 750 milligrams per kilogram per day, and this was in GD20 rats. And this is uh, because we know DIMP is a PPAR agonist and has been shown to cause liver weight effects. We also took the maternal liver during this study and weighed it, and we did see an increase in maternal liver weight at 250 and 750 milligram per kilogram per day. I don't believe that's related to the uh, reproductive or developmental effects, but um, we did want to um, check out just for completeness. And so in, in, during the study, concurrent with the study, we also uh, measured the metabolite dis disposition. Uh, so we looked at fi four, five different metabolites of DIMP, including the free monoester, MIMP, three oxidative metabolites of the MIMP, the main primary metabolites that have been identified by Silva et al. And um, in addition to that, we also looked for the glucuronide conjugate because there was evidence from 
um, some in vitro studies that the rat was able to conjugate MIMP in vitro. And so um, for that, we actually had to prepare our own standard and, and develop a method, but uh, we were able to, to measure the glucuronide in the blood samples. And uh, we evaluated the maternal plasma, pup plasma, maternal urine, maternal liver and placenta, as well as the fetal testes and amniotic fluid. The tissues, the time points, and the doses were all based on previous studies that we've performed at the Hamner with DBP, which shows, um, which gave us a good idea of where we might see saturation of metabolism or oral uptake, and um, the tissues that we, we knew we should be able to see some of these metabolites in. So these are just the plots which show you that we, um, looked at all five metabolites, and we were able to see all five metabolites in both the maternal and fetal blood. We actually saw all five metabolites in, in all of the tissues. In the urine, there was a very, very negligible amount of the glucuronide and free MIMP, which I'll show you in a second. In the blood and tissues, the primary metabolite was the carboxylated uh, MIMP, and uh, then the second most prevalent metabolite was free MIMP itself. PUP levels were uh, about three or four fold lower than uh, the maternal blood levels um, pretty consistently. This is to show you basically that there was a saturation in oral absorption uh, at the highest dose. And you can tell that because the, the C-max does not increase with dose, the, the, the maximum concentration. And the area under the curve flattens out with with dose, but the elimination was uh, linear with time, suggesting that clearance is not saturated with dose. And the maternal urine metabolites, uh, the carboxylated metabolite of MIMP was the primary metabolite, which has been shown before by Silva et al. We did see MIMP and the MIMP glucuronide in the urine, but it was very low, less than 0.1% of the dose. So a preliminary analysis of DIMP, we used a, PBK, a, pharmaco, a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model, which has been, uh, which uh, I developed at the Hamner for DEHP, and uh, just applied it to DIMP. The first run, we didn't change any parameters because it looked an awful lot like DEHP, the metabolite kinetics. And um, I won't go into the model, but what we basically found is that the metabolite, can, the model fits the DIMP pretty much just as well as it fits the DEHP. And I'll admit that the model is really preliminary right now and it needs a little bit of adjustment. But what this tells me is that the pharmacokinetics of DEHP are very, very similar to DIMP, which would indicate that any um, differences that we see in potency between the two chemicals is probably a pharmacodynamic difference. And, um, and so that's where we are with the kinetic study. Uh, so for the postnatal effect study, which is probably more of interest to uh, the panel here today, um, we consulted several experts when we, when we developed this study, including Shelley Tile from RTI and Earl Gray from the EPA, and they were very helpful, and I'm very grateful to them. We made a lot of changes to our study design, including extending the, from PND14 to PND49 to include adult or, or postpubertal effects. And, um, we, we kept more animals than we intended to, so we ended up with an N of 20 litters per treatment group and at least, and as many male rats as we could possibly keep because of limitations in how many were born. <laughs> so sometimes you get five or six male rats per litter, sometimes you get one. We kept as many as we could. Um, so, so in order to be as comprehensive as possible, we had, and as you know, sensitive as possible, we had a, as many as uh, 24 litters per treatment group. Uh, we began our diet, we had dietary dosing in order to keep it more human relevant. Uh, we began the dosing on gestation day 12 and we treated through PND 14. Uh, we kept all necropsies and observations were completely blinded, so we had a, a system where we gave the animals letters and uh, anybody who was in the necropsy room did not know what those letters equated to as far as treatment group goes, um, and that includes the histopathology as well. So um, for endpoints on PND2, we looked at AGD. We took testis testosterone from one male pup per litter. We don't want to do more than that because we would have reduced the number of animals for PND49 observations. 
and we looked at testis and epididymis histopathology. On PND14, we measured AGD and nipple retention. This was not a necropsy time point. This was just external observations. And then on PND49, we looked at AGD, nipple retention, testis, testosterone, hypospadias, or any thallus malformation, and pre we measured prepucial separation. We also looked at the morphology and tissue weight of 10 reproductive uh, tissues, including the liver and kidney. So um, this just shows you the actual or calculated DIMP dose, which was calculated from the amount of food that was uh, taken in by the animals, which was measured four times a week, and the concentration that was measured analytically in our food. So during gestation, we were, our target doses were 50, 250, and 750 milligram per day, kilogram per day. And during gestation, we were pretty much right on target. And in lactation, due to the increase in food intake and the decrease in maternal body weight, the, the doses reached as high as twofold higher than our, or actually a little bit more than twofold higher than our target doses. So we were at or above our target doses throughout the study. So on postnatal day two, we did a decrease in DIMP at the highest dose, 750. None of the other doses showed any body weight effects on PND2. This is different from GD20. There was no body weight effect in the, in the fetus on, G, on GD20. AGD, only DBP, and I should have mentioned that we included DBP as a positive control for this study, mostly because we didn't see much happening in the, G, in the gestation study, and so we wanted to have a positive control to compare all future uh, effects to. So the, the dose of dibutyl phthalate was 7,600 parts per million, which equates to about 500 milligram per kilogram per day during gestation. So we did expect to see effects at this dose. So for DIMP, we did not see AGD effects, but we did see them with DBP. For multinucleated gonocytes, um, we did see an increase both at DIMP at 750 milligram per day, and we saw an even greater um, increase with uh, dibutyl phthalate. Um, in addition to that, we did see an increase at the highest dose of DIMP and at DBP for uh, latex cell aggregates. And this is an example of the histopathology, which you probably can't see very well, but it's just highlighting what our pathologist uh, was uh, calling multinucleated gonocytes and latex cell aggregates. On PND14, we saw a pretty substantial reduction in, in neonatal weight at the highest dose. It's actually about 30% of their body weight. It's, um, I believe this is uh, probably due to palatability of the milk. Uh, some of the data with DEHP shows that at high doses where metabolism or hydrolysis is, is saturated, you actually get the diester at pretty high concentrations in the milk. So um, uh, because all this, this drastic weight reduction is only present at 14, none of the other time points we looked at. DBP, there was still no um, weight effects. So for AGD, we saw a decrease on um, PND14 in both the high dose DIMP and the dibutyl phthalate positive control group. Um, and when we scaled by body surface area, that, that uh, reduction in AGD did, um, was maintained. I, I believe that it's possible that there's still some confounding factors there with the, with the neonatal weight because it is so drastically low, but um, right now it's difficult to tease that out. Um, we also looked at nipples and areola. We did not distinguish between nipples and areola at PD, PND14. We only, we just, everything that was there was counted. So the only increase we saw was with dibutyl phthalate. Um, and on PND49, where we're looking for uh, permanent effects, we used PND49, assuming that the um, prepucial separation would be finished by then, <laughs> given some expert advice. And it turns out that even in our control rats, some of the rats hadn't reached fully complete prepucial separation by PND49. So we ended up bringing in um, an expert from Earl's lab to discuss this with him, and he suggested a scoring scale of zero to three, where um, three is complete separation and one is no separation at all. 
and one and two, or zero is no separation at all, and one and two then are, you know, partial separation and then almost completely done. And uh, so that's how prepucial separation was scored in all of the remaining uh, necropsies. And so based on this prepucial separation score, only DBP caused a delay in prepucial separation. Only DBP caused permanent nipple retention. And uh, none of the treatments, including DBP, caused a permanent change in anogenital distance, whether we used the absolute or scaled. Uh, we also performed histopathology on PND49. We did not see any permanent effects from any of the DIMP treatments um, for, for um, DBP, there wasn't any statistically significant increase in the changes in the histopathology on PND49. However, there were some really dramatic effects like complete atrophy and mineralization, and we did have a genesis of one testis. So. And uh, these are the different tissues that we looked at, their weights, and um, the DBP, we saw a decrease in seminal vesicles, ventral prostrate weight, LABC weight, and the kidney weight at um, 500 milligram per kilogram DBP. We did not see a change in any of the reproductive organ weights at any of the DIMP doses. We only significant effect we saw with DIMP was an increase in gubernacular cord length in the lowest dose, but not at the higher two doses. I don't believe this is a treatment-related effect because we don't see a dose response trend. And in addition, a lengthening of gubernacular cord is not what you expect to see with a phthalate. You'd expect it to see it be lower. So, um, all right. And then as far as the morphological effects, um, only statistically significant effects that we saw were in DBP, and that was incomplete epididymis, which means it was missing a part of the, and it was incompletely formed. Um, generally, that was the, the body of the epididymis. Sometimes it was the head or the tail. Um, and these were confirmed by histopathology. And the flaccid epididymis, which is a term that we kind of coined, I haven't seen it around, but basically what it meant, it was, it was really mushy and squishy and it should not have been. When we gave that to the, the histopathologist to look at what she said, or the pathologist, I'm sorry, to look at, she said it was, it, it had more fat cells, it had in, um, and uh, less, uh, less actual epididymal tissues and the tubules were generally larger. So, um, so probably fatty epididymis might, might be more descriptive. And um, for DBP, we also saw uh, one incidence of undescended testis. We did see one animal where it had complete atrophy of the testis and epididymis unilaterally. And uh, we saw mild or slight hypospadias. We didn't see any really dramatic hypospadias. We didn't see clefts pallus, but we did see slight hypospadias or mild hypospadias in um, five out of 21 litters in the DBP group, and um, exposed Oz penis, which just suggests it's a little bit more severe thallus malformation in uh, one out of the 21 dibutyl phthalate litters. So none of these effects were statistically significant for DIMP. We did um, not see an increase in the flaccid epididymis, and we didn't see any incidents of incomplete epididymis at the higher doses, though we did see a couple at the very lowest dose. And so um, this is, last slide is just a comparison for, for um, you guys to look at. It summarizes the, the differences in effects between di, diisononyl phthalate and dibutyl phthalate. Um, diisononyl phthalate clearly causes effects on body weight, which is not seen with DIMP. Um, the di dibutyl phthalate causes nipple retention, changes in AGD at pretty much every time point except PND49. It alters thallus development, epididymal development, prepucial separation, and four of the reproductive organ weights were decreased in our studies. And um, we obviously histopathology effects. And then for DIMP at doses greater than 250 or mill milligram per kilogram per day, we do see decreases in body weight. And um, we did see a decrease in, in AGD, but only on PND14. We did see some changes in micro or multinucleated gonocytes in latex cells. 
So in conclusion, we believe we've defined, we devised or designed and with the help of several people, several experts, some present here today, including uh, Kim has helped quite a lot in at least uh, advising on who we should seek out for help with the pathology. So, um, so that was helpful. And then also Earl Gray was um, involved in this, at least gave us advice or, or reviewed our, our original um, plan. And Shelley Tile too. And um, anyway, so we've developed a pretty comprehensive suite of, of studies. I think we've established a clear Noel of 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. We just don't see anything, whether it's in gestation or lactation, at 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. At 250 milligrams per kilogram per day, we did see a significant increase in multinucleated gonocytes and testosterone reduction on GD19 and um, the AGD on PND14. Um, all of these effects were recovered at later time points, and so I guess it's a matter of debate whether you would call these adverse or not. Um, the role of testosterone as part of the leading mechanism to the male effects, I believe, is unclear at this point. Um, uh, but uh, we, we did establish a change there. I think probably most importantly, I believe this is a third bullet of the slide, is that we did do a global analysis based on um, similar to what Earl Gray has, has recommended before in the and Paul Foster recommended previously in the literature. So for that analysis, what we basically did was if they showed any of the suite of effects that are possible with the phthalate exposure, we called that rat a positive. So it was a positive responder. If it did not, it was a negative responder. And then we did a global analysis. And um, only DBP was statistically significant for what could be called the rat phthalate syndrome, uh, um, DIMP at 750 milligrams per kilogram per day was not, was not statistically significant from control, even when you included the entire suite of effects, which includes prepucial separation, nipple retention, all of the malformations on PND49. So that analysis was performed on PND49 only. And so, that would be the, the end of my talk. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Or if you want to send questions later, I'm, of course, available. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, if we'll take any questions for clarification. CHAP committee? Andreas. Did you, <clears throat> it wasn't clear from me from the details which you provided whether uh, you corrected for litter effects in your statistical analysis. So litter as a random factor influencing what you saw. Okay, so what we actually did, um, and this was, I worked with a statistician on this because I am not a statistician, and so, um, and I've actually, right now, uh, the approach that he is is slipping my mind, but we did, we, what we did was um, actual control for multiple pups per litter, and um, oh, so you looked at the individual effects and then um, we looked at the number of animals per litter, and, and we did account for the for the number of animals per litter. Is that what you're asking? No, no, no. No, it is it is well known that if you compare um, animals from the same litter, they are, they are quite similar to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you compare animals from different litters, they are not necessarily very similar to each other because you have something like a litter effect. Mm -hmm. Or in fish biology, it's called a tank effect. If you keep fish in the same tank, the biological response will be similar, more similar to, say, the fish in a tank next door. Mm -hmm. With litters, it's exactly the same. For a statistician, that means that if you have the responses from each of the animal from one litter, you can't pool directly with all the data from the second, third, whatever litter. You have to adjust for the fact that animals from the same litter are in fact more similar to each other than if you make the comparison between litters. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. Did you adjust for litter effects in that way? 
I, well, I believe so, but I would definitely have to check with our statistician. I can I could show you the spreadsheet that he used, but and then I, I believe it was the jackknife method for comparing um, uh, between litters. It's a and I could give you the reference also that he used, but uh, yeah, that was certainly something that I was asking him. We needed to control for um, for variations between litter and within litter. So yes. Uh, the, I'm sure you're aware of the paper by Borch et al., which came out in Reproductive Toxicology, I think, last year, where they also did a um, DINP study. Yes, yes. Boberg now, yeah. Boberg, yeah. Yeah. Of course, yes. <laughs> she got married, yeah. Yeah, she did. And um, I, looked, uh, I looked at their data in comparison with yours, and there, there are actually a lot of similarities. But one, on one point, um, when they did what you did with uh, testosterone production, no levels, they also measured testosterone levels, e exactly what you did. But in addition, they measured testosterone production and saw a much more pronounced effect of the INP. Did you do the same experiment or have an overlook? We did this? not. We did not do the ex vivo testosterone production. So okay. that, that's a, um, how Hannes et al. did it too. They do the ex vivo test testosterone production. So Boberg et al. actually did not see the level of effect that we did with the um, the the concentration or testis in vivo concentration. So they didn't see um, a consistent testosterone reduction that way. They did see it when they did the ex vivo production, um, but I believe ours actually showed more of an effect than theirs on, t on testosterone. They also saw, they saw um, I think if I compare the, the testosterone data they published with what you have presented here, there's, there's I think a fairly good agreement also with uh, anal genital distance. However, they observed uh, retained nipples, but you didn't. And now it comes, mm, they used Wistar rats, you used Spagdolis. Mm -hmm. How, it's a more general question, bearing all this in mind, how do you see your results in relation to theirs? Can we attribute this to species differences? Will this alter the overall conclusion, or what's your view? Uh, I believe the results are very, very similar. I have actually spent quite a lot of time looking at her paper because there are, are there are a lot of similarities, and um, uh, but, you know we are very, very similar. Um, I, I believe the doses where we see effects are very similar. We actually saw AGD at se effects on PND14 at 750. They didn't see them until 900, but really at that point we're at really high doses. So um, the um, I would say, in general, um, uh, that these these papers could be used together. I, I, I believe that they're uh, together. It's a pretty comprehensive suite. What differences there are? It could be strain. It could also be number. Some of what we looked at, we had a much higher um, n statistical uh, power, I guess, because we had an n of twenty, uh, and where some of some of their endpoints. I mean, it varied per endpoint, but some of their endpoints they had as low as five, but. Um, I, I think that could play a role. We did see the same trend that they saw with the nipples at PND14, but the change was so slight. We're talking, I mean, a control of 1.5 and a, and a treatment effect of 1.8% of the rats. So, I mean, I would say with you have 20 litters or more that at that point, it's just not statistically significant effect. But um, I suppose it is possible that it's a Wistar effect. I haven't done too much evaluation of the Wistar versus versus Sprague Dolly. Kim? Um, so I think at the end you suggested a disconnect between the fetal testosterone levels and the ultimate phenotypic manifestations that you might anticipate from low fetal testosterone levels. I did, which makes me sad because I've been pursuing the testosterone for quite a while. Yes. So given that you're, you know, you observe, I mean, you actually observe quite a significant fall in fetal testosterone levels. About with the 50%. INP, right. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have an explanation, an alternate explanation for uh, DBP's effects, which where that connection also, you know, does seem to be present between lower fetal testosterone and phenotypic outcomes and the lack thereof with the INP? 
I do. Well, I have two hypotheses, and this is what I present in my paper, and I don't know if either one of them is right. And, uh, and I, I believe either you need more than 50 percent inhibition of testosterone to manifest all of these effects. So DVP, where you see most of these effects, actually causes 80 percent inhibition or more. It causes at 500 milligram per kilogram per day, DVP causes 97 percent inhibition of fetal te testis testosterone. So that it pretty much wipes it out, right? Or at least that's what Kevin Guido and um, Susan Borgoff studies both show. So that's that's significant. That's almost complete loss of testosterone while the DBP is in the system. But DIMP doesn't seem capable of producing that much inhibition. Even in the new Hannes et al. study, they went up to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day, so 1,500 milligram per kilogram per day, and they still were not able to reach that level of testosterone inhibition with DIMP. So, and I believe that's a, that's a kinetic reason. You just can't get that much DIMP into the system. Um, so, so that's one possibility, is that DIMP just can't produce enough testosterone inhibition to get you there to these uh, to the full complement of effects that DBP causes. Or the other option is that there is actually a mechanistic difference. Perhaps there's um, more than one target there with DBP. We may not have discovered it yet, though it's clear that some of the testis effects that happen with DBP are not related to testosterone. I mean, some of the papers that you and, and Kevin Guido worked on together have shown that testosterone is not related to, to some of the, the histopathology endpoints, and also cryptorchidism seems to be require a, um, a additional uh, targets besides testosterone alone. So it's possible there's another target that DBP is hitting that DIMP is not. I, don't know that I could, I can't say that for sure because I'm not even sure what that target is. If, yeah. I just, just make a comment that I, I think in a, a, an alternative explanation okay. um, would be that DINP is not hitting testosterone in what we call the masculinization programming window. That's up to E18.5. And it's only in that period that you can, that suppression of testosterone will lead to overt male reproductive disorders. If you treat beyond that time and suppress testosterone at the end, there's absolutely no measurable consequence. Well, we and, I mean, and we AGD treated from is a readout of that early effect, not of the late effect. Well, right, but we did treat from gestation day 12. Oh, yeah, so that's what I'm saying is that in the data that I'll show in my talk, then the effects of even of DBP are relatively modest in that critical window. They're much more profound afterwards. And there's an explanation for that that I'll also show. So I think that your DIMP, based on its lower overall potency, uh -huh. would probably be having a, a negligible effect in that programming window, but in a more pronounced effect later on. Okay, I guess I'm not entirely sure what what you're saying because I I mean we did measure out further I mean we looked out to PND 49 no I'm 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 saying that the effect is when you ha when you affect testosterone in the fetal testis the critical period is up to E18.5 after that quite honestly it doesn't matter what suppression you get after that the only thing you're going to have an impact on is something like Satoni cell proliferation or penis growth Okay, but if the uh, if the DIMP is present earlier in gestation, why wouldn't it be affecting testosterone? Uh, uh, well, I'll I'll show you why in my talk. Okay, I'll, I'm happy to look at that. Okay. Chris, so there there are a lot of endpoints that you looked at. Um, so did you look at um, sort of thinking of of an individual pup as sort of a single pup and look at um, sort of the combination of endpoints so that uh, a pup would be designated as having an effect if one or more, you know, taking into account this sort of syndrome approach? That's what we did. That, that was a global approach that I described at the very end. I didn't get too far into it, but yes, we did okay, do that. I didn't catch that. Sorry. Yeah. So, and when we did that, a DVP was statistically significant from control. In fact, our p value was like 0. 0.00001. So it was like, Three zeros and a one. I'm not sure how many zeros I said, but it was very significant. The, uh, but DIMP was not statistically significant at any of the doses, and that was that was assuming any effect meant you were positive. Yeah. Jim. 
Just to follow up on Richard's comments, so uh, you may have treated on GD 16, 17, 18, but you actually didn't measure. We didn't measure testosterone. 16, 17, or 18, and you know that's the window in which okay. the phenotypic endpoints are determined. We did okay, so we didn't measure testosterone on GD. I mean, okay, so we treated from GD 12 to 19. Um, we measured testosterone on 19. Uh, but uh, we didn't measure testosterone earlier than that. We did actually measure some blood levels in the fetus and dam on GD16. I can tell you the DIMP or the MIMP was at equal levels in the fetal blood on that day than it was on 19. So earlier, the, the MIMP and all of the other metabolites were present in the fetus, but I did not measure the testosterone that early. So I hope uh, Richard Sharp's talk on will, will elucidate the issue with the testosterone production. Um, but we early on agreed in CHAP that we would see fetal reduction of testosterone production uh, as a, an important endpoint to consider. So uh, having a look at your talk, you, you kind of confirm the study by Hannes that uh, DINP significantly reduces fetal uh, testosterone production. And you also confirm uh, Hannah's work that uh, you would regard the INP about two to three times less potent in that respect. Um, I think from our studies, so our in vitro studies with DBP, which is our, our history with DBP is quite extensive, and uh, our current studies with DINP, I would call it probably about four, but three or four fold, so pretty close. Mm -hmm. 3.8. If you look on a, if you look on, oh, 3.8, oh, so, okay. Um, but that's if you look on an external dose basis. And so, I mean, I didn't talk about that much here, but I think, the, you know, it's really important to consider metabolism here. And uh, there is an extensive uh, kinetic database for DBP in the rat, in the rat fetus. And there's, you know, this new PK study with DIMP. And so I think it would be really wise to actually look at fetal blood levels for the active metabolites when you're going to make this, this uh, comparison. There's actually a group at the Hamner right now that's working on that as part of an EPA STAR grant. So they're not including DIMP in their analysis right now, but they are looking at five phthalate metabolites at comparing the pharmacokinetics using PVPK modeling and uh, of the five different metabolites and then also looking at potency of testosterone inhibition using in vivo, in vitro assays and, um, you know, developing a risk assessment based on internal dose and pharmacodynamic potency. So I don't know if you're interested in hearing from them, but that's my uh, fellow group at the Hamner. I still try to distill out the important messages from your talk. Okay. <laughs> so you have a uh, novel regarding testicular testosterone reduction of 50 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. Yes. And you have a novel regarding uh, germ cells, morphological changes also at 50 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. And you say that uh, those two endpoints seem to be triggered by different mechanism mechanisms. Um, that's possible. It, me saying that is coming from work that has been performed previously with uh, dibial phthalate from Kevin Guido and Kim Buckelhyde was on that paper. So as far as that, that difference in mechanism goes, he might actually be the person to talk to. So he's not with You'll you. Yeah, he's the multinucleated gonocyte germ cell expert. <laughs> so uh, Kim Buckelheide will elucidate the issue with the germ cells and uh, Richard Sharp will elucidate the issue with the fetal testosterone. So I'm looking forward to it. But again, you confirm the, the novels and the effects that have previously been observed for DINP in your study. I, I believe that we established a novel that had not previously been established. So, I mean, we, we measured at lower doses that have been measured. Nobody else has measured that low. Everybody seems to think you can start at 750 milligram per kilogram per day. I, I disagree. I think you need to go lower so that you can find out where your true Noel is. And um, also, 750 milligrams per kilogram per day is not human relevant. It's just not. That's a hugely high dose. Oh. Noel has been 50. 
Our Noel is 50. I can absolutely stand on that. Yes. No more questions. Thank you for your okay. presentation. Thank you. Thanks for letting me come. Okay. Kim, are you ready? Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. That's too bad. Um, I'm very happy to be interrupted at any time during my presentation. And you know, I noticed in Becky's presentation, no one asked any questions during the talk. But I hope if there's any points uh, from the slides that you have questions about that you'll stop me so I can uh, provide clarification or at the time where we can go back and look um, at those points. I'm really going to speak about exposure during the fetal period. Um, I'm, you know, I've looked at both uh, Leydig cell endpoints and at germ cell endpoints, and uh, you know, one of the things that we've looked at is human uh, xenotransplants to try to look at cross species for effects, and the focus of that has been on Leydig cell endpoints. And I'll also be speaking to multinucleated germ cell endpoints, but this is all in the context of fetal exposure. You don't need this background for your information. You're all aware of this. Um, but just for the general audience, you know, there have been uh, increases, apparent increases in the rates of some male reproductive tract endpoints over time over the last 50 years, cryptorchidism, hypospadias, sperm quality, testis germ cell cancer. And that those changes have been in the context brought forward by Richard Sharp uh, and others of changes in uh, of the vulnerable period of development in the fetal testis. Uh, so if we look at the cell types involved uh, in this period, we have Sertoli cells, germ cells, and Leydig cells as potential targets. Altered Leid Leydig cell function, lowering uh, testosterone, and INSL3 production can contribute to the formation of cryptorchidism and hypospadias. And altered Sertoli cell function can lead to impaired germ cell development and then the manifestations of altered sperm quality and testis cancer. And this has been contextualized in the context of a syndrome uh, known as testicular dysgenesis syndrome that encompasses a spectrum of disorders that are interrelated and may share a common origin in developmental exposure. So that's all I'm sure familiar to you. Uh, and Phthalates have come to the fore in this regard because they recapitulate some of the changes that are uh, seen in the human population in this regard in uh, rodent models. Uh, and there's significant exposure to phthalates, um, some of which happens in critically ill neonates, uh, or at least has historically that, you know, the phthalates are being removed from much of those plastics at this time, but there is still significant exposure there. So that is in general background. Um, and I'm going to speak primarily in the first part of the talk to the Leydig cell effects. And then I will turn in the second part of the talk to uh, germ cell effects. So if we look across species, so you'll see on the bottom here, we're looking at rat effects, mouse effects, and human effects in the context of uh, targeting seminiferous cords and uh, the Leydig cells. And so the seminiferous cord effects that we measure are multinucleated germ cell induction and changes in seminiferous cord diameter. Uh, the Leydig cell effects that we measure are changes in steroidogenic genes that then manifest as alterations in testosterone levels, both uh, within the testis or uh, secreted by Leydig cells. And then endpoints dependent on uh, testicular testosterone levels in, in the fetus. And those endpoints would be anogenital distance, hypospadias, cryptorchidism, ligacell cell hyperplasia, and nipple areola retention. So in the rat, uh, with phthalate exposure, you get all of these effects, as you're very aware. 
Um, in the mouse, you do get the effects on the seminiferous cords, so you have induction in the mouse of multinucleated nucleated germ cells and increased seminiferous cord diameter. But you do not get the effects uh, resulting from, uh, that you see in the rat uh, due to Leydig cell suppression of uh, steroidogenic gene expression and testosterone secretion effects. So you don't see this uh, in the mouse. Um, so the question for us and why we got involved in the work I'm going to tell you about, which is xenotransplanting you know, human fetal testis, is to try to resolve this species discordance, discordance that we see between the rat and the mouse. And I actually got involved in the mouse work uh, during a sabbatic leave, which I think was in 2003, so this goes back a while, and started to do the mouse work because I wanted to be able to use the genetic manipulability of the mouse to ask questions about targeting of the phthalates in the fetal testis. In particular, I was interested in the Leydig cell effects. And then, you know, it was actually quite enormously frustrating that the mouse did not turn out to behave the same way as the rat, so that one could sort out some of this targeting information uh, using uh, transgenics and knockouts uh, in the mouse. But given that species discordance, you know, we started to ask the question, what happens in humans? You know, are human, is the human fetal testis response more like that of the rat or the mouse? And, you know, the approaches that uh, one can take to answering that question are epidemiologic approaches. Um, there have been, a, as far as I know, three papers now that have looked at uh, exposure in the moms in humans and then outcomes in uh, newborns in terms of predominantly anogenital distance as a measurement of effect. Uh, this turns out, I think, in, in my mind at least, to be a very difficult kind of study to do from an epidemiologic point of view. These studies have been small numbers of individuals. You're making single point measurements during a critical time in the mom distant from the effects on the fetus. Um, and measuring mom exposures but not fetal exposures. So, you know, these are, in my mind, fairly exploratory, the epidemiologic data so far uh, that's been uh, available to look at this question. In vitro cultures have been problematic in this area. And I say that uh, predominantly because in the rat, which is our most robust, robust model, uh, the rat in vitro cultures of Leydig cells have not, both as organ cultures and as single cell cultures, have been uh, really variable in their ability to report the phthalate effect in terms of a suppression of stero steroidogenic genes and testosterone secretion. Some of that problem has to do with primary cells when placed in culture, even in the context of the organ, begin to undergo a change in their function that's actually relatively rapid. So by the time 24, 48 hours after transfer into culture media, you've actually lost a lot of the differentiated function in those cells. Um, and cell lines uh, tend to be um, not responsive in the same way as uh, in vivo primary cells. So in vitro cultures have been problematic uh, given the positive control systems that we've been able to look at. So that led us to look at xenografting as an alternative approach. And the model that we've used, uh, you know, we first have validated our xenografting approach using rat and mouse xenotransplants and then moved to looking at human xenotransplants. So I'm going to tell you about those experiments. Uh, what we have done for the rat and mouse is to take fetal, this is a uterus full of fetuses from a rat or mouse, so we take um, GD16 rat fetus testis, transplant those into a host, and we do our transplants into the renal subcapsular space, uh, and we've chosen that space because it's highly vascularized, it takes really quite well. The fetal testes uh, are easy to find there. They don't move around. Um, and 
We then exposed to a phthalate, and we'd been using DBP or control, uh, and then collect the fetal testes. And uh, as you'll see from the data I present, we've been doing time course exposures. So we, um, we do the transplant. I'll, I'll show you a slide in a minute let them go, uh, and then look over time at what the changes are. Uh, one of our first questions was, you know, is this difference between rat and mouse? So rat, rat is sensitive in terms of Leydig cell suppressive effects and mouse is resistant. Is this an intrinsic property of the testis itself or is it a host species property? Uh, so to address that question, we've taken uh, fetal testes from rat and mouse and uh, transplanted them both into rat, immunodeficient rat hosts and immunodeficient mouse hosts. All right, so this is our first set of experiments. So after we, you know, sort of address this question, I'll show you the data on that. And, it, you know, our data suggests that, in fact, the response is intrinsic to the testis and not host species dependent which makes sense. Then we uh, went forward and looked at the human response. So here's our model. Uh, GD16 rat testes uh, xenograft, xenografted into the subcapsular renal space uh, in either a rat immunodeficient host or mouse Im immunodeficient host. Uh, let them go for 24 hours and then exposed to dibutyl phthalate over a range of doses uh, over a period of three days, harvesting six hours after, after each exposure. So our time course experiments that I'll show you are by collecting testes six hours after an exposure using this very acute uh, transplant model. And so we initially did that uh, by transplanting uh, fetal rat testes, and I'll show you the data on that, and then the data on transplanting uh, fetal mouse and, and fetal human testes. Can't, can't see this very well because of the lights, uh, unfortunately. But here is kidney uh, in the host with the capsule, and here is the fetal testis transplanted into that space. Um, and, you know, actually these transplants look remarkably good. Uh, these arrows are pointing to multinucleated germ cells that are induced in the dibutyl phthalate exposed hosts and transplants as compared to the control. And here's uh, the kind of data that I'll be showing you for each of these species in terms of uh, the transplant effects. Uh, so in this panel, so treated is always in the light blue bars. Uh, the control is in the gray bars, and this is multinucleated germ cells per total germ cells present. So we use the total germ cell denominator just to provide a base for, of reference. Uh, and we're looking here at two doses, comparing 250 um, milligrams per kilogram per day dibutyl phthalate uh, compared to control in these fetal uh, transplants. We've done this over a time course, um, and we also are looking in this panel at steroidogenic gene expression, and it's a set of genes, uh, CYP11A, 17, SCARB, STAR, and INSL3. And you can see with increasing dose, so we have a dose response here of 250 and 500 milligrams per kilogram per day, that there's an effect uh, uh, what becomes a consistent effect on steroidogenic gene expression at the 500 milligrams per kilogram uh, per day exposure level. Um, we also have testosterone secretion data, so this is then removing the implant, putting in uh, into short-term three-hour culture and measuring the level of testosterone uh, secreted by those implants after exposure in the host setting uh, and measuring what the testosterone production is. Um, so this set of data is consistent in our transplant model with what one would expect to see in the intact in vivo setting in the rat. We have an induction of multinucleated germ cells. We have an effect on steroidogenic gene expression and we have an effect on testosterone secretion. 
uh, in this RAT setting. All right, so in the mouse, we have the same uh, histopathologic picture. Again, this is in uh, kidney. This is in the rat host. Uh, we have induction of multinucleated germ cells in the, that helps, thanks Mike. Uh, and then we have uh, this similar kind of data. So again, looking at 250 milligrams per kilogram per day and 500, we have multinucleated germ cell induction uh, at both doses uh, and essentially no effect on steroidogenic gene expression in, at these two doses in the mouse. Uh, and no effect on testosterone secretion in the testosterone production assay. So the mouse data is also consistent in this transplant model with the in vivo fetal testis response in the mouse. So, you know, this was all into a rat host. And you know, one could think of the rat as being the permissive species, in essence, uh, because the rat responds. Um, but we also checked this effect uh, by going into mouse hosts. Uh, this model took a lot of work to develop. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time optimizing the timing, graph location, the host hormone environment. So we're actually going into intact hosts. We looked at castrate hosts, we looked at hypophysectomized and castrate hosts, uh, and in this short-term acute model, we did not see, at least at a crude level, a difference between those host environments. Um, so what we are looking for was effects on the seminiferous cords and uh, Leydig cells, and you know, we repeated the studies that I just showed you with the mouse host, and it gave the same uh, in vivo consistent responses for the rat fetal testis and mouse fetal testis as I showed you for the rat hosts. Uh, so the response in our hands is an intrinsic response to the fetal testis itself. It's not a host-dependent response. And, you know, we consider this then a, our proof of principle. We have a sensitive species response and a resistant species response for this technique and proceeded from that point to start looking at human fetal testes and their responses to phthalate exposure. So this work has been um, ongoing for uh, several years in terms of collecting samples. Uh, what I show on this table is the range of gestational age of the samples that we have. So it uh, goes from 10 weeks gestational age up to almost 24 weeks gestational age. Uh, one of the issues to keep in mind is the postmortem interval, that is the time between uh, delivery of uh, this material and are getting it and implanting it. Um, we found no relationship between this period of time and the results, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. And we've minimized, what, or we've kept that length of time to less than uh, 36 hours for our work. Uh, the other important uh, aspect of this to keep in mind is these are spontaneous abortions only. So we have received material only from fetal losses that would happen anyhow. Uh, so there's typically an underlying cause here. Uh, in many of these cases, there's an infectious process going on that leads to the spontaneous loss. There's something going on in the background, some of which are noted here. So there may be genetic anomalies in these fetuses uh, or other aspects of physiology or infection that have led to this outcome. And we tried to take a look at whether these uh, other effects might be influencing the results that we have seen, and we haven't been able to see any consistent uh, effects of these other ongoing uh, processes on our outcomes. Um, 
This is a human fetal testis transplant, I believe from an 18-week uh, gestation fetus. And uh, we uh, did labeling with uh, bromodeoxyuridine in this sample for a three-day exposure, or a three-day time period and a three-day uh, BRDU exposure. And what's remarkable, really, is the amount of proliferation that is taking place in these fetal testes after xenotransplantation. And it's in all the cell types. So you can see germ cells, Sertoli cells, and Leydig cells are proliferating in this setting. Uh, this is a CD31 stain for human um, vasculature in the transplants. And as you can see, there are vascular elements in the human uh, fetal testis and, in fact, moving into the renal uh, parenchymal space from the transplant. And these seem to be patent and viable vascular spaces. So based on this data, these are proliferative, uh, the fetal testis trans human fetal testis transplants, proliferative and vascularized at the point that we're looking at. Uh, with the exposure, again, we're comparing dibutyl phthalate exposures and control. Uh, we do get induction of multinucleated germ cells, and the data is consistent um, across day and across dose in terms of multinucleated germ cell induction. So again, it's the same uh, uh, legends here. The blue is the uh, dibutyl phthalate exposed uh, compared to control, a dose response of 100, 250, and 500 milligrams per kilogram uh, dibutyl phthalate. Uh, and one day, two days, and three days and this is, you know, an initial 24-hour period, so we do the transplant, we wait 24 hours, then our one-day treatment is an exposure followed by a an, an, uh, removal of that fetal testis six hours later. So this is 30 hours after initial transplant, 30 plus 24 for two days, et cetera. And we've looked at the steroidogenic uh, gene expression and see essentially no effect uh, on the Leydig cell steroidogenic gene expression uh, with this exposure, again, across doses, uh, and this is after two days of exposure. We have not looked at testosterone production in this model. Um, so, and that's a limitation of the results that we have to this point. Okay. So, summing up this set of data, um, our human fetal testis response is similar to the mouse, um, and we see a consistent effect across species on multinucleated germ cells. I'm going to turn to speaking to that in a moment. Uh, but a species discordant effect on Leydig cells, steroidogenic gene expression, and the human fetal testis response is similar to the mouse response in being resistant to uh, effects on the Leydig cells. And, and is there a reason why you haven't done the testosterone production? So we're, you know, that we, we tried looking just at uh, implant testosterone levels, not the uh, production in culture. And those levels were very low, first of all, but also all over the place. It was just extremely noisy. And we just haven't had the samples to try other approaches. Um, and we plan to make use of a technique that Richard has used quite successfully and published on in terms of looking at physiologic endpoints like seminal vesicle weights in the host as a readout for integrated testosterone production. And I. I'm hopeful that that will work. We just haven't gotten uh, to that point yet. So the implications of you know, our results are that you know, the human uh, effect would be similar to what you would anticipate in the mouse. And, and in fact, then you would not anticipate having those testicular dysgenesis syndrome consequences that are testosterone dependent, such as hypospadias and cryptorchidism appearing uh, in humans. I want to sort of step away from this for a second and just look at the comparison of what's going on in rodents 
uh, versus humans in terms of windows of susceptibility and secretion of fetal testosterone. Tim, before you Yes. Go you want on, me to go back? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that strikes me is that we don't know in any of these systems is how much DBP is getting in to the testes in all three of these situations. No, that's so that's so we don't know that in human, although we're looking at that right now. But we have published in uh, the mouse work, and this would be Kevin Gatto's paper, uh, the levels of, of DVP that are in mouse fetal testis, and they're similar to what get, is present in rat fetal testis. So we know that the exposure at the level of the fetal testis is actually the same in the mouse and the rat. We just don't get the response in the Leydig cell in the mouse that you see in the rat. That is known. That is known. That is published. That's published. So that's Kevin Guido's paper, 2007. Okay. So that pharmacokinetic, that is verified pharmacokinetic exposure levels uh, are similar in the two species. And what, for the transplant studies, it's all the same species, right? So the host is, you know, it's all rat host. Does that address the, that question? So you consider DBP as the active species? Excuse me? So you consider DBP as the active species or? No, no, MBP. MBP. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you And that was measured yeah. as well. So we would say the, the, the kinetics of MBP would be imp the important point to consider. Absolutely. MBP in and MBP out. Yeah, well, MBP at the level for these effects at the level of the fetal testis. So you are in, in the column for the humans investigating the effects in human testicles with red or Host. mouse Host. metabolism and metabolism kinetics. Correct. Would you consider human and red metabolism similar? Um, in terms of the capacity to generate monoester from diester exposures? In this term. Yeah. Um, I, th I think there probably are differences, but the underlying esterase activities are present in both species. I'm not sure that we quantitatively know the difference, but I would say at very low levels of exposure, there's going to be sufficient esterase around to convert diester to monoester to a large degree in both species. What about the kinetics? Because you said both in and out is important. Would you consider kinetics similar too in rats and humans? Um, Would you consider rats being faster or slower than humans? In terms of secretion? Yes. I think we're in the same ballpark in both species. Based on what data? Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> now we're, we're also talking about placental right. transfer. Right. No, I understand. Um, Right, so I don't know that we know placental, the placental kinetics in humans. Um, we know that data well, I'd say, in the rodents, but we don't know that in the humans. You know, so it's, it's more of an extrapolation in the human setting. Um, just one more point, though, on this exposure uh, situation. Uh, you know, the fact that we have multinucleated germ cell induction in all the species, in all the models that we've looked at, means that exposure is getting there. Because you have to have, you know, the phthalate has to be getting there to be producing that effect. So there is an exposure that is happening, at least sufficient to induce multinucleated germ cells. Yeah, that, the reason I asked my question is that that could be caused by a very low exposure. In other words, that's, that's not very true susceptible. in the rat. So we know very, we know in detail what the dose response for multinucleated germ cell induction is in the rat. And in the rat, the, 
low L effect for multinucleated germ cells is actually quite similar to the low L for Leydig cell testosterone effects. They are essentially identical. So that, you know, that just, you know, that's a nice sort of positive control for exposure. Yep. Another question. Would you consider the C max or the area under the curve more important? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the data that's, so the Hamner has done a, an exposure with DBP, uh, bolus, gavage dosing, and food. And interestingly, and I think surprisingly to me, the uh, dose response effects were really quite similar for the endpoints that were being measured. And so that would suggest that area under the curve exposure is actually more significant or more important than Cmax because Cmax is going to be much lower in a feed exposure setting. All right, so we're going to go to this diagram and just speak generally about some of the uh, vulnerable windows and differences between species. So Richard uh, Sharp raised the point that the, you know, the development of the male reproductive tract is actually in the rodent happening in the first part of this window when testosterone secretion is actually being initiated in the fetal testis. So it's, it's early on in this this wave of testosterone production. The responsivity to phthalate exposure actually happens throughout. Um, but the determination of end organ physiology, uh, like what can be disrupted to give rise to cryptorchidism and hypospadias, is actually relatively early on. And that's true in the human as well. So, uh, the events that are happening that are important are occurring in gestation week, you know, 8 through 12 or so in the human, but the actual peaks of testosterone secretion are happening out at gestational weeks 16 and 18. Um, in humans, this developmental window is much, much broader, and the secretion window of testosterone is much, much broader. There's a lot of parallelism in the events that are taking place across species, but the compression in terms of time is, you know, remarkably contracted in the rodent. There's also in, in uh, humans an interesting postnatal, early postnatal period, and I think uh, Richard's going to speak to this in more detail, when there's sort of what's called a mini mini puberty in humans, which is in a window that happens you know, within the first six months of life. Uh, and it's, it's sort of been recognized to encompass uh, testis, you know, enlargement, um, a mini sort of spermatogenesis spurt that takes place at that time, including some increases in testosterone levels during that window. And, and that may have important physiologic consequences uh, during that time. And actually relatively little is known about that time period from the perspective of underlying biology and physiology. Um, so, you know, what I'm going to turn to uh, now is uh, work that we have published recently looking at the multinucleated germ cell effects uh, resulting from uh, phthalate exposure. Yes, please. Before we go there, the, yep. um, to a question relating to the windows, yeah. which, you, which you explained. Uh, in the rat, as far as I know, the male programming window starts at around 15 and a half embryonal day. Is that right, Richard? Thereabout. If I translate that into the human, we would talk, um, as you said, weeks 8 to 12. Now, your earliest uh, material from spontaneous abortions is from week 10. Correct. So you would be probably out of that window. Or So I have two questions. First question is, uh, how do you judge your material with relation, in relation to the window of sensitivity in the human? And secondly, would you guess that if you work with material older, say closer to 23 weeks outside that window, that you can draw any meaningful conclusions from these experiments? All right, so um, 
I'll first speak to what we know about in the rat. Um, so in the rat, the phthalate effect on steroidogenesis and testosterone production occurs throughout the time period of fetal testosterone production. So there is sensitivity in the Leydig cell to phthalate-induced suppress suppression of testosterone production and steroidogenic gene expression throughout this entire window. Now, the, you know, the important um, sort of end-organ event steps are early in this window, but the phthalate effect is constant throughout that window, or at least persistent throughout that window. Um, we don't know, of course, in human whether that's true, uh, whether there's a difference in the sensitivity of the fetal lytic cells in human out here as opposed to early on. What we, you know, our average sample is about an 18-week gestation sample. We do have some early on samples. I think 10 and 14 are our earliest samples. We don't see any difference in the response dependent on age. There's not a sensitivity here that is lost. It's, you know, th there's a resistance throughout in terms of light cell effects throughout that window. I can't really say more than that. I know Richard has worked with uh, much earlier cells, uh, fetal testes than us. Uh, well, not strictly. We have done some first trimester, but nothing in any great detail that we could draw conclusions on. But I think, I mean, your point is extremely important. Um, but if we take fetal testis explants as well as a readout, then there have been fairly detailed studies done by René Hebert and also by Bernard Jégou using human fetal testis first trimester explants, and there's no effects on steroidogenesis. Um, so at least there's a consistency. But I think not xenographs. But René Hebert is doing the xenographs with first trimester, and he's using the same protocol that we're using. I, I don't know what results he's found. Um, but I would be surprised if he finds effects, but um, science constantly surprises us. So um, I think there is always the possibility that it could be different. But as I'm going to show, then it, if the mechanism by which DBP affects the rat, if that's the vulnerable mechanism across species, then um, I, I don't see why, if you don't see an effect late on, that you would expect to see an effect early on. But, you know, there are presumptions in that. Can I, can I summarize? Can I check whether I understand this correctly? Okay, we agree that the male programming window in the rat is earlier, in the earlier part there. It corresponds to about, uh, let's say, week 8 to 12, thereabouts, in the human. Um, <clears throat> so we have this question or this question mark, but your argumentation to say the xenograft material from the human fetal testes that comes from later week, that these experiments are still valid or meaningful because if we did the same in the rat, we would see salate effects on testosterone production throughout uh, the male programming window and beyond, i.e. at later stages. Is that correct? Correct. Thanks. But again, we have you didn't you didn't look after these effects. Could you again please show the slide where sure. you have shown the results? The other yep here. Yep. Um, what is the insulin like three here? That's uh, a Leydig cell um, factor that is important in cryptorchidism. Are there effects or no effects? Uh, no. So this is the 100 milligram per kilogram dose, and you know I think that's just an anomalous finding there in our PCR results. So this is 100, 250, and 500. Um, so I'd say that's noise in our system. Okay. Just um, Kim, in, in terms of the. I don't know, you had maybe 20 or 25 different samples right. across just, how did, how did you, so each one was an experiment in and of itself, a, a transplant, right, a xenograph. Um, yep. How did you then combine them to look at whether there were or were not differences based on gestational weight? I mean, did you 
say all those before 12 weeks versus those, you know, 18 to 22 or so what we you can't look at them really each individual. Right. So right? for each of our human fetal testes, we took the fetal testis, diced it into you know millimeter cube kinds of fragments, put them into control rats, and put them into phthalate treated rat hosts, and you know then compared the results in treat with treatment or not. And we tried to do linear regressions with age. We tried to do linear regressions with post-mortem interval. For anything else that we could think of that might be significant uh, determinants of response. And we didn't see any tendencies across. Is that then just the one-to-one -one comparison, kind of the control to? So we did, like, made ratios of any parameters that we thought might be of interest in but the treated versus power, control. Could you have Tried to say, you know, all those taken within the. We tried to first clump trimester. them. We tried to clump as well, and we never saw anything that was consistent across any of the parameters that we thought might be informative, like age. Differences by gestational age. Yeah. Uh, let me just go back one more, and then you can see. Uh, here is is that. I'm having trouble seeing those numbers, though. Okay. Could you just point out how many numbers are um, on the timing that's less than, say, 12? So we've got 10 and 14, 13.4, um, 16, and then it sort of goes up from there. So it's so okay. I, I couldn't even tell it was it was uh, ranked. Right. So it is sort of ranked except for that. 10 and 14. <laughs> so there's only one value less than 12. Yeah. And then we, you know, our average is 18 actually. 18 weeks. So the window is an important question, then. It is potentially an important question. I, I, if you believe uh, the rat argument, the response remains throughout gestation in the rat to phthalate exposure. Does it change in magnitude at all throughout um, that? Yes. It, yeah, yeah, it, you know, I think Richard is saying, yes, it does. <laughs> it, it, it gets more pronounced in later gestation. The, the, the levels of testosterone pronounced. actually go up quite significantly with time. The magnitude of the change in testosterone. The, mag the magnitude of difference between the control and the phthalate exposed gets much larger later in gestation. In fact, at E15.5, we find no significant inhibition at all. It's only towards the end of the programming window that you begin to get effects. And there's a logical reason for that, mechanistically. Um, and I think that explains why DBP actually, or other phthalates, have relatively modest effects in terms of causing um, things like hyperspadias, because they don't cause much suppression of testosterone in the programming window. They cause much more pronounced suppression later on. Again, I'm looking forward to this talk. Um, how did you make sure that you measured the gene expression and the hormone-like effects in the right window? When did you measure it? Because we have seen that two-hour post-dose, there are effects for DINP, and 24-hour post-dose, there, there mm. are no effects anymore. How did you ensure that you measured in the right window? Okay. So we only measured one time point after exposure, and that was six hours. And that is based on the pharmacokinetics that we know for DBP in the rat. Right? So you know something about the kinetics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that would be in between the two hours and the 24 hours of the Gluel study. Excuse me? That would be in yes. between the two right. and the so, so for each of the days, so we measure, you know, we've done time courses, day one, day two, day three. After each daily exposure, we sampled six hours later, consistently six hours later. But you didn't test if it would, there would be an effect observable, let's say, two hours or 24 hours. You just measured at six hours. Just measured at six, and that's based on what we know about the rat response to DBP for steroidogenic gene expression from studies that Kevin Gaido has done. So you would assume that the effect at the six-hour post-dose in the Kluwel study would be bigger? Then 
Well, she was looking... Then two hours and 24 hours right. post-dose. What was her endpoint at two hours? I'm trying to remember whether she... Testosterone. Testosterone. So we were, look, we're looking at gene expression, yeah. you know, which is a different endpoint, which is presumably earlier as an endpoint than testosterone. So the gene expression is earlier. Should be. So if she measures... Yeah, actually, that's, that's actually complicated, but yes. <laughs> so there is an immediate testosterone suppression effect after phthalate exposure that is probably unrelated to gene expression decreases. Uh, but then d gene expression typically also declines, and you get a later, much more significant decrease in testosterone levels. But your rationale behind choosing uh, the sampling time point of six hours post-dose was based on kinetics. Kinetics in the rat. Yep. Okay. Uh, so moving on to... We're now going to look at multinucleated germ cells. That question, and I'm going to tell you about, and this is published work, um, tell you about an, uh, a set of experiments that we've done to look specifically at this question, because this is the, this is the endpoint of phthalate effect that uh, is conserved, appears to be conserved across species. So this is the publication reference here, uh, Safarini et al. in Journal of Andrology. Um, and this, this work is, has taken place in the P53 null mouse, all of the work that I'm going to talk about here. Um, and the rationale for using the P53 null mouse is we know a lot about the role of P53 uh, as an apoptosis-inducing um, gene in mouse for germ cells. You know, so we've looked at that question for a long period of time. And, you know, so our rationale in using the, P50, so the, using the P53 null mouse was we know the mouse is responsive in terms of the induction of multinucleated germ cells. So we know we can induce multinucleated germ cells in this model. What we wanted to do was remove any drivers for the apoptosis of those germ cells and then see what happened. So when we started this project, we're thinking, okay, we're going to get rid of this very potent uh, apoptosis-inducing uh, germ cell gene, and then we'll see what the life uh, experience of those multinucleated germ cells is in the absence of their dying uh, after their induction, which is what typically happens in the rat and the mouse. You know, these multinucleated germ cells, they all go away. They all die by apoptosis by a couple weeks postnatally. And so the concept for this study was, let's get, get rid of this, you know, important and powerful driver of apoptosis and see what the life history of these cells is. So the model was to take these mice, uh, so pregnant dams, uh, exposed from gestational day 12 through birth uh, in the P53 uh, null. We, actually, it's a heterozygous dam, uh, and so there are pups that are delivered from these moms that are both homozygous deficient in P53 and heterozygous in P53. And then we looked at various time points, GD19, uh, PND1, 4, 7, 10, and then later on in adulthood, for the presence of these multinucleated germ cells, the numbers of them, and their uh, life history. So, uh, at GD19, we induce, uh, we see the presence of, and uh, we're using an exposure of 500 milligrams per kilogram uh, per day, uh, dibutyl phthalate. We see the induction of these multinucleated germ cells. And this is what the, you know, the kinetics of the presence of these cells looks like. Uh, so again, we're comparing P53 null to P53 heterozygous uh, pups. And one, uh, you know, there are a couple interesting points here. One is if you look at the control, so this, this is a P53 null pup that is, has not seen any phthalate. It has actually quite a higher incidence of multinucleated germ cells than, a, uh, than the um, heterozygous control. So being null, in P53 means that you have more multinucleated germ cells. And that, 
might make some sense if these cells are predisposed to die. If you remove that driver of apoptosis, then they can persist and you get more of them, whether you have phthalate on board or not. In the presence of phthalate, so that's these filled uh, markers, uh, you get a, you know, another quite uh, significant induction in the numbers of multinucleated uh, germ cells. So in the null, that's the circles here, you know, you get a lot more uh, multinucleated germ cells with phthalate treatment than without. Um, but overall, the null environment is conducive to the presence of these multinucleated germ cells. So one of the points that I think is an important take-home message here is that multinucleated germ cells normally occur. You see them. They happen at a certain frequency. But as you can see from, you know, the time course here, all of these, or at least a majority of these multinucleated germ cells are eliminated fairly rapidly after birth. Um, so in the mouse, they're gone, you know, to um, almost a full extent by day 10. And here's some of the quantitative data on that. One, you know, one thing that we observed in this model, uh, however, was that there was a persistence of very abnormal and large uh, germ cells that were multinucleated into adulthood in the P53 null setting. So only animals that were P53 null that had also received phthalate manifested the presence of these, you know, relatively bizarre very large cells into adulthood. So in fact, the experiment worked in that sense that we removed this driver of apoptosis and, you know, we don't have formal proof that these are in fact the same germ cells that were induced in the fetus that are then uh, persisting into later life. Um, but they're, you don't see these kinds of cells normally in the testis, they're very abnormal uh, and are um, Presumption is that, in fact, these are cells induced by phthalate exposure in P53 null mice that are persistent. And this is the kinetics of the persistence of those cells, and there are very few of these cells. Uh, they're there. Uh, essentially, they're all gone, and these, uh, by the time these mice, you know, are less than a year of age. So the window of the survival of these abnormal cells seems to have been extended by the fact that we've removed P53 as a driver of apoptosis. Uh, but it's not infinitely um, extended. And uh, the suggestion is by these kinetics that, in fact, these cells do not divide. They were induced in the fetus. They persist. They're allowed to live because you don't have P53 around anymore but they, under, they do undergo death and apoptosis at some rate and ultimately are all eliminated. Um, so we uh, used markers that are known to be present on gonocytes, OC3,4 and placental alkaline phosphatase. So OC3,4 here, this is a GD15 uh, fetal testis where the gonocytes are uh, labeled with this marker. You don't see that on the germ cells at GD19 that are multinucleated, and you don't see it on these very abnormal germ cells that are present in the testis later in life in these P53 null mice. Uh, and placental alkaline phosphatase, this is a placenta syncytiotrophoblastic staining. You don't see that as a marker, gonocyte marker. That's not present on these cells at GD19, and it's not present on the, these abnormal adult cells either. And so, as shown previously, uh, these cells do not appear to be gonocytes. And that is uh, at least important uh, conceptually because um, when we think of testicular germ cell cancer, we associate that with the presence of carcinoma in situ cells, which are seen as precursor cells for the production of testis germ cell cancer. And carcinoma in situ cells carry with them gonocyte markers, the presence of gonocyte markers. And uh, so carcinoma in situ cells are abnormal gonocytes. The hypothesis then for testis germ cell cancer in humans is that there's some abnormal event during fetal development that sets aside some cells uh, that sort of freezes them in a gonocyte stage of development 
which then manifests later as carcinoma in situ cells. They express these markers. And then there are some other induction events that lead to the development of testis germ cell cancer in young adulthood in these individuals. And the suggestion from you know, many studies, Richard Sharpe's and this work as well, is that in fact these multinucleated germ cells are not gonocyte in origin, do not then share with carcinoma in situ cells the kinds of markers that one would anticipate. Um, and in, even in the setting in which you're removing a major driver of apoptosis, these cells are not proliferative and don't persist. Uh, they persist for a while, but they don't persist or proliferate um, later in life. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about, about this. Um, we also, because we do xenotransplants, we also did xenotransplants of these P53 null phthalate-exposed fetal testes from mice into wild-type mouse hosts in order to allow them to even live longer um, because we we're trying to give them as much of an opportunity as possible to develop into germ cell cancers. That was our concept, and we never saw anything that would suggest that outcome uh, in this model, which you know, one might imagine would be predisposed to this kind of outcome. So the, the, in the human transplant mm -hmm. tissue, the MNGs, do they have these? Immunohistochemistry markers the OCK3-4? Um, yeah, we haven't actually done that work yet. I think, Richard, you have. Um... Sorry, Russ, I missed the question. So the, the human... Um, xenotransplants. Xenotransplants oh, yeah. in terms of their immunohistochemistry, is it... So some of the germ cells will be expressing OCK4 and some won't. Age-dependent. And, and it will be age-dependent. Yeah. The earlier in gestation, the, the greater the proportion of OCK4 expressing cells. For the human. For the human. But, but there, there will be some there throughout the whole of gestation. They're still there till up to six months after birth. So is, is that different than what's yeah, occurring in the rodent? Completely different. Completely different. Okay. So it, it, it's a big, the process of germ cell differentiation is, um, is fundamentally different in Certainly the human and the marmoset, we don't know about other primates from rodents. Um, it appears, I was discussing this with, with Kim and, uh, and just saying it, it just looks like it's haphazard in human, like it was just thrown together, whereas it looks a sort of a Rolls-Royce job in rodents. Okay. Um, so I want to just give you, uh, just conclude with a word about where we're going with this. Uh, what we'd like to do is separate out the compartments, so the seminiferous cord compartment from the interstitial compartment, and then compare, you know, that's using laser capture and microdissection, a a compare across species to try to see what the differences are uh, in what we're observing in rat versus mouse uh, versus human. Um, so just a little bit of general discussion about um, these results. So George Box you know, said all models are wrong, but some are useful. He was a statistician, so as far as I'm concerned, all statis statistical models are wrong. Um, I would say for biology, for our work, sorry about that, um, all models are limited. We need to know what the limitations are. Um, they all generate information, and one of the issues that you are grappling with is that, in fact, with the phthalate literature, there's a huge, huge literature. In fact, this is by far the best studied compound in terms of the effects that you're looking at of any that I know of. And that mass of information generates both clarity and noise. Um, so, and there's just lots of inputs now into, as you well know, into the phthalate uh, literature. So we have animal models that are traditional toxicology models, knockout transgenic strains, and xenotransplant models now in the mix of information, uh, information that you're dealing with, in vitro models, cell culture, organ culture, and human models, epidemiology databases, and exposure surveys. And phthalates 
are part of you know every one of these, and you know an enormous amount of data. And I um, wish you the best of luck in sorting through you know this this mound of uh, somewhat discordant information. I'd really like to thank um, my group. I do want to. Uh, let you know that I have received funding from the American Chemistry Council for uh, some of the xenotransplant model development work. So that money went into um, the creation of the model, but it was specifically targeted to the animal development work and not to any of the human uh, fetal transplant work. And you know this work has been supported also widely by NIH and could not have taken place without the help of the folks at the hospital. Uh, women and Infants Hospital. So I thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any more questions now or later. Great. Thank you, Kim. Some more questions. Or should we, I think we should go on and do uh, Richard's talk so we can then break for lunch and come back and have discussion this afternoon. Does that make sense? Short break. Can I just one ask question. one sort of a, at an overview level? I mean, based on your final slide there. I mean, if you were in our position where we had and I have been, by the way, I was on the previous chat panel, so <laughs> on phthalates. Where we had to make a decision. Um, I mean, how would you come down on the whole concept of a rat model for reference doses uh, in a risk analysis? Um, well, it's interesting. I, I, I think our, so if you only had that data, that's of course what you would do, right? You have to do it that way. It's become much more nuanced with the information that we have. So the certainty with which you feel comfortable relying on that data has, I think, changed significantly as we learn more and more. So for me, actually, the exposure information becomes really the driver uh, for the risk assessment that you are sort of conceptually doing here. So you have to really put your, you know, wrap your mind around whatever exposure information you can get at target and interpret that. Um, I think there, I mean, I am more and more impressed that there are really significant differences across species, both in biology and in sensitivity. And I say that not just based on this fetal testis work that we're doing, but we're, we've also now expanded um, the number of tissues that we're looking at to other tissues and the responses that we're seeing in other sort of classic rodent models of effect are just very, very different in the human developmental fetal exposure setting. So I'm impressed that there are very, very significant differences across species. I'm sort of dancing around answering your question uh, directly. Um, let me think about it, and we can talk about it maybe at the end of, of Richard's talk, because that's another, a very important question. But another question, just from a, from a you know, statistical analysis perspective. And which, of course, is a model with a, you know, yes. Yeah, of course it's wrong, yeah. or maybe useful. Um, the, the question is, you know, when you say there is no effect, I'm not seeing anything. I mean, uh, that was a lot of sort of the, the points that I was taking from what you were talking right. about, not knowing all the biology there. So. I mean, can you can you put limitations on your own thinking on that? I mean, what are the on the uncertainty of the, that observation? Sense of what yeah. if you have the wrong window? What if you have not a, a big enough sample size? What if it's not as large of an effect and you're just missing it? Uh, I mean, I would imagine there's a list of those sorts of limitations. Oh, I think there are lots of limitations. Um, I so I think there are a lot tremendous limitations in the model that we're using. You know, so the host hormonal environment matters, uh, even though we're doing very, sh you know, acute short-term exposures, and that's, I think, somewhat limits the impact, impact of the host hormonal environment. The timing in terms of, you know, where the fetal testis is in terms of its own development probably matters. All I can tell you from what we've done is that we, I've been impressed consistently by the lack of response at the Leydig cell to the phthalate exposure. That, you know, consistently we just do not see a response in the human. And that's so unlike the, the germ cell response in terms of this multinucleation effect. We see that always. And, you know, so there's a dramatic disconnect there, which means the response to me looks so much more like the mouse um, in the human. But 
Sorry, the whole concept of the spon of the uh, spontaneous abortion t tissues. Mm -hmm. uh, not, I mean, I don't know much about those kinds of um, situations. Uh, could they actually have an effect on the light cell mm -hmm. development or responses? Or I mean, you talked about right. potential uh, infections. So we've, or yeah, whatever. we've looked at that carefully and and haven't seen anything. So the the cases in which that you would imagine that might matter is if you had an anencephaly, for example. So you have no uh, input, uh, at least conceptually, input of you know, which isn't maybe very important anyhow, but input of hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis in the fetus, you know, so that's not very important early on in this process anyhow. But we have not seen anything related to maternal environment that resulted in the spontaneous abortion affecting this outcome. You know, so, and um, we looked. Do you think you have the numbers to see it? Is, yeah, is I mean, you know, so we're are up in 26. So many different kinds of. We're, we're up in 26 effects. samples, and they, there's been a real consistency in terms of the lack of light egg cell response, and there's been a consistency in terms of the uh, seminiferous cord response. But are you treating the um, the, the spontaneous aborted um, tissues as if it, as if they're similar? I mean, could there be distinctions in those that you we've your tried aren't grouping? Big so to we've see. tried grouping across genetic disorders that we know about that are present in these fetuses, infection if we know it's there, and encephaly or other sort of uh, nervous system disorders. We tried any kind of grouping, and we don't see actually any difference in the outcomes that we're looking at, even numerically. Yeah. How about with the postmortem time? Do you see? And no, there's no. no there's no apparent effect of postmortem time. And in the animal to animal model, do you? We have not done a different a difference in postmortem time in the I animal. Tried to yeah, we haven't done that for the uh, animal transplants. But you pointed out to us the significant noise you were observing. Yes, there is significant noise in the system. There's no doubt about that. Ken, thank you for sharing <clears throat> very important information. It is reassuring to see somebody working in an area that broadens our knowledge rather than makes it deeper but in a narrow cut. So thank you for your contribution. How important do you think it would be to expand your existing model of the transplantation with other phthalates so that we see the response of your system to Phthalates of different potencies. Uh -huh. I think that's a great question. Um, everything that I know about phthalates would suggest that the active phthalates act in concert, act in the same way, act at the same targets. Uh, you know, so what we know from the rodent models is that DEHP, for example, should have the same kind of response pattern. Uh, you know, we haven't looked at it in human, but the anticipation is that it would be similar. It's a formal question, and it's an important question, you know, that one look at something else, but uh, there's been such a consistency in terms of molecular response, you know, so Kevin Guido looked at the patterns of molecular response, it's really quite persuasive in my mind. Can you offer a mechanistic explanation for these species differences which you observe? So the rat on the one hand seems to be sensitive, mouse and human not so. Um, can you offer any mechanism that might explain that? Can we uh, postpone that until after lunch? Let's take a... Great question, by the way. Let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and, and have Richard's presentation, then we'll have lunch, and then we'll come back and answer that very important question. Richard's going to tell us the answer. <laughs>